couple teas and coffees for the first 15 minutes or so and doing the quiz. Uh, but we just thought for tonight, we're just going to reverse the order. Is that okay? So Barry is going to share straight with us uh, uh, right from the very start. Uh, and then we're going to listen to what, what God has to say to us uh, through, through him. Uh, and then uh, we'll have the fun at the end. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Fantastic. Come on, let's give Barry a welcome. Nice to see you, to see you. Turn to somebody at your table and say, I'm so glad that I'm me. (laughs) Now say to the same person, I'm so glad that I'm not you. (laughs) Have you ever heard the saying that once you're an addict, you're always an addict? Well, on the 17th of May 2007, my book was released and I gave it this title on purpose, Once an Addict. Why? Because I was once an addict and now I'm clean, actually 25 years clean. Tonight I'm going to tell you my story, but I want to say this at the start. I am not here to tell you my story to glorify my past. I'm not. The reason why I'm here to tell you my story tonight is so that you can look at me and think, hey, if he can change, that means I can change. In fact, if he can change and stay changed for 25 years, that means anybody can change and stay changed. That's if you choose to change. So I'm not here to big up myself in any way. And I know each and every one of you have got your own story to tell. I know that some of you have been through things in life that I've not been through. I know that as well. But tonight it's my turn. (laughs) I was living on William Kent Crescent, which is one of five blocks of flats that was in Hume, Moss Side, Manchester. They had the nickname the Boring's because they were shaped like Boring's. And I just sold from drug to this guy. And as he was walking out through the front door, two coffers came walking past. They stopped, they looked through, they saw the drug on the table. They walked in. They charged me with possession of a Class A drug. It was heroin with intent to supply. And because I had other charges, no way did they give me bail. I ended up in Strange Ways prison in a cell with a guy called Spike. He was into drugs and so was I. Do you know the way, there are ways of getting drugs into prison? My girlfriend at the time was called Lisa. And way back in the day in Strange Ways prison, you could have visits six days a week on remand. And she would visit me more or less six days a week. We'd have our little chats, and just before she left, we'd have our goodbye kisses. And that's when she passed her drug from her mouth into my mouth. It was a Saturday afternoon, I was laying on my bed, and Spike was laying in his bed. And it was really quiet, which was unusual for a Saturday, because a lot of people get visits. And especially in those old Victorian-type jails, there's a lot of noise. You can hear people walking up and down the steel landings, Doors opening, doors closing, prison officers whistling, lads chatting outside your door. But on this particular Saturday, so quiet. Spy, why is he so quiet? I don't know, Baz. The key went in the door and think, great, time for my visit. The door opened, sniffer dog came in, prison officers behind it. Right, lads, stand up, you're being busted. Busted for what, boss, we've done now? Of course we were lying. The dog sniffed around the cell, the officer searched the cell. They didn't find any drugs because they'd come before our <coughs> visits. But they found some other drugs paraphernalia in the cell. So they put us in solitary confinement. And on the Monday, we had to go and see the governor. He added five weeks to our sentence and he sent us back to the block for five weeks. So I've gone Saturday, Sunday, Monday without any drugs in my system. I wasn't feeling well. My back was aching, my legs were aching. I wasn't well. And there was one officer that used to work down the block, or segregation as we call it, and he would shout stuff through the, my spy hole to wind me up because he knew I was an addict. But let me take you back to the beginning of my life because my starting life was good. I was born in Salford in Manchester. My dad was originally from Stainforth in Doncaster, a mining community. His dad was a miner. His brother was a miner, and I've seen a picture of his mother, and she could have been a miner too. (laughs) 
He got drafted into the army, got stationed in Salford, went to a club one night called Finches. That's when he met my mum. When he left the army, they settled in Salford, got married. Then my brothers were born, and then I was born. My parents tell me that I was an ugly baby. In fact, I was so ugly, the doctors put me in an incubator with tinted windows. <laughs> the midwife took one look at my face. She's just like my mother, I wasn't a pretty baby. Went to primary school. It didn't take me long to realise I had the IQ north of a bedroom slipper. The wheel was turning, but the hamster was dead. Have you got the picture? Went to secondary school. I hated it. Physics, how's, it gonna, how's that going to help me in my future? History, why do I need to learn about history? English, why do I need to learn English? I'm a Mancunian. We've got an English of our own. We use words and phrases like nice one, top one, sorted, bang out of order. In it. I left school at the age of 16 with all qualifications, and that's when I met Craig, Huey, and Psycho. Psycho had crossed eyes. So when he looked at you, he never actually looked at you. He looked above you, around you, at the side of you and under you, but he never clocked you in the eyes. He had tattoos on his fingers, love and hat. He'd not put you on the end of hate. And they went into smoking weed, cannabis, taking LSD, using amphetamines. I started to hang around with them and take the same drugs. They were taking, we were young, and we were determined that we were going to have some fun. It was a Friday night. We were in Jackie Marshall's bedroom. She was on a council state in Solver. Nine of us were crammed into Jackie's little box room. We're smoking cannabis. The room's full of smoke. We're listening to Bob Man the Whalers. The windows are vibrating with the bass line. We've got money in our pockets and we're getting ready to go to Manchester like we did every weekend. And the door opens and Huey, one of the lads, comes walking in. Hey guys, hey guys, I've got some heroin. Who wants some? And I remember the look on Craig's face. He was always the first to jump in. I'm up for it. You we said I'm game. Everybody had it and I was the last one. Come on, Woody, it's your turn. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be the odd one out. I was injected with it, man. Was I disappointed with the effect? We met up the next day in the Bull's Head pub. What was all that about? What a waste of time that was. Because we didn't even go to town. We just stayed in Jackie Marshall's bedroom, gouching out. Then we had it again. And again. And again. And before you knew it, we were taking it every day. But if you'd have said to me then, Barry, are you an addict? I'd have said, no way, I'm in control. I can handle it. We used to go to a pub in Manchester called The Union. Arm robbers are going to the union. You could buy knocked off gear in the union. You could buy drugs in the union. I liked it in the union. Because these were my kind of people. And do you know what I like? They didn't judge me. In those days, you could smoke indoors. So if I wanted to smoke cannabis in there, I could. If I wanted to take other drugs or go to Chance Street bus station, they didn't judge me, and I certainly wasn't going to judge them. In fact, I liked it that much in the union that I started to go on my own without Craig, Huey, and Psycho during the week, and I got friendly with this mixed race girl called Kareen. That's a real name. In my book, I've called her Colette for legal reasons. It just so happens I've got some of my books on that table, by the way. <laughs> when my book came out in 2007, Once an Addict, as a charity, we started a project to give a copy of that book to every prisoner in the United Kingdom for free. Right now, there's 90,400 people in prisons in the UK. We have sent 52,500 copies of that out free of charge. One small way you can support that, for every one copy of Once an Addict You Buy, we then use the profit to send two into prisons, and, the, and then there's a little bit more profit that we use to help us with the rest of our prisons work. I'm going from here to Norwich tomorrow. I'm going to be speaking in Olesby Bray Prison on Tuesday night. In August, I speak in 10 jails in London. I speak in 42 prisons a year. So all the funds that come in through that, of course, goes into the charity that I run. But we aim out the money for that lot. It goes into our prison ministry pot. So Corrine, she was into selling cannabis. And I was watching how easy she was making money. I'm thinking, I could do that. So I started to sell cannabis, and I started to make decent money. 
Then I started to sell other recreational drugs, and I started to make even more money. I was in the union one night, sat next to the jukebox, smoking a spliff, which is a cigarette with cannabis in. And Kareem was sat opposite me, talking to this white girl who had blonde hair and blue eyes, and she had her nose pierced. I mean, not a lot of people were into body piercing back then. I mean, the Asian community, community, like the Hindu community, have been doing it forever, but it's not something a lot of people were doing. And she looked really quirky. And they were chatting and looking over at me and laughing. Chatting, looking over. At, I'm thinking they keep looking over. and <laughs> They must be talking about me. The blonde went to the toilet. Kareem came over. But have you seen that blonde bird that I'm talking to? Yeah, she fancies you. I'm like, ah, nice one. <laughs> In it. Do you know who she is? Well, I knew of her because she was going out with this Rastafarian who we used to score drugs from. And she lived with this Rasta, but I didn't know her. I went to a club that night and she knew I'd be there. So she came in, cloistered. She never used to come in, but because I was there, she came in. So I bought her a drink, gave her a lift home and I started to sit behind the Rastafarian's back. Eventually, there was a confrontation and she left and we moved into a block of flats that are still there today in New Moss Side, Meredith Court. I was there with Channel 4 TV 10 years ago, filming my story. So now I've got a base to deal drugs from. So people come to my flat any time of day, any time of night. So I started to make even more money. That's when I started to sell heroin. And I just want to pause this right here again and say, I am not telling you my story to glorify my past. To be honest, I am playing this right down. But this is just my journey. So I started to make even more money. I had a nice car. I had a nice flat. Everything was nicked from Habitat in my flat. I liked Habitat furniture, and there was an Habitat on Deansgate. All the shoplifters would come to my house in the morning, what can I get you today, who were into drugs? So they'd go and nick stuff and come back, and I'd pay them with drugs. I had good clobber, good clothes before you could get all that stuff over here. Everything was going great, and then I got nicked. Do you know crime can pay? And it can pay really well, but at some point, no matter how smart you are, you're going to get in it, and you're going to lose the second most important thing you've got. The most important thing that we've all got in this room is our health, and the second is your liberty. I got remanded in custody. Strange Ways Prison, this was my first time in Strange Ways. I was under 21, and before they put me on G Wing, which is the young offenders wing, they put me on the hospital wing because I was an addict, there was no treatment then. Did some time on remand, came out straight back to the madness. Manchester, ducking and a diving, wheeling and a dealing, got nicked again. Got nicked again, ended up back in prison. I was now locked onto this treadmill of having to commit crime to pay for the drugs that I was addicted to. I came out from one sentence, Preston. Lisa met me at the gate. I've got my discharge grant in my pocket, my train pass to get me back to Manchester. Come on, Lisa, let's go and celebrate. All I want to do is get off my face. All I want to do is get stoned. Landed in Manchester, got a taxi. By now, Lisa was living on the bull rings. First thing that I did that day, went to my doctor's, got my Valium, my DF-118, my Tamazepam that I used to sell. Bought loads of amphetamines. They give you energy. And I just wanted to celebrate getting out of prison. One day, two day, three day, no sleep. One week, two week, three week, no sleep. Barry, you need to get your head down. I don't need to get my head down. Do you know how much sleeping I did in Preston Prison? I used to give myself a headache through trying to sleep. Give me more amphetamines. Three months, no sleep. Four months, no sleep. And do you know, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, and God is my witness. The acid house thing had kicked off in the Hacienda nightclub. I know what I'm going to do, Lisa. I'm going to start to make acid house music. So I built a little studio and I'd just sit there creating beats, making music, whizzing out of my face, celebrate getting out of prison. Nine months. Then right out of the blue, the phone rang. And I thought, somebody's calling. Right out of the blue. It's all right. I started to hear voices. Lisa, can you hear those voices? The people that I knew who lived on the flats where I were living, I thought they were at the windows shouting across at me. When I flushed the chain, I'd hear voices 
coming out of the water as it went down the bowl. Can you hear those voices, Lisa? It's all in your head, Barry. Don't you tell me. It's all in my head. They were real. I stopped taking the amphetamines, but the voices didn't go away. I lost all my confidence. I was frightened. I wouldn't go outside the front door. They were as real to me then as you are to me today, 100%. Eventually, I went to see a doctor. He sent me to a psychiatrist. The diagnosis was amphetamine psychosis. He sent me to Chiro Psychiatric Hospital. I'll never forget that day. Going down Princess Parkway in the back of this private hire taxi with Lisa, and it was raining, and the water was splashing outside the wheel arches. And in the sound of that water, I could hear voices. I'm thinking they're following me to Cheadle. Cheadle Road was the lowest point of my life. I've been in some tough places. Been in jail a few times. I've been in the block, storage confinement. I've been in a padded cell in Leicester Prison in a straitjacket with my arms strapped round me for having a fight. I won. Sheila Royal was the worst place I've been, though, because now I was out of control. And there's nothing the doctors could do or give me to stop these voices. Flash forward nine years, I'm still hearing voices. I had to learn to live with them. By now, I was split up with Lisa. By this point in my life, I was so poor, I used to go to KFC to lick other people's fingers. I'd lived in three hostels. I spent a year in one of those James Street Salvation Army hostels. And then I got a flat. But some people were after me, so I had to get out of town. Then I moved into another hostel on the outskirts of Manchester, another Salvation Army hostel. I got kicked out of that one, though, for having a fight. Colin Mottized, who was my project worker at the time, he wrote on my file, Barry Woodward is a very violent man, never to be allowed back in. He now manages his own, manages his own Salvation Army hostel now, in Blackburn. Seven weeks ago, I was there speaking to his clients. He's allowed me back in. <laughs> one better than that, nine years ago, we got a letter at our offices from the CEO of the Salvation Army. Top guy, cordingly inviting Barry Woodward to be a keynote speaker. I had to Google what cordingly meant. but <laughs> And I went to London and spoke at their annual AGM. So now I'm well and truly back into the Salvation Army. Then I got a little flat down a cul-de-sac. When I went to see it, I was made up. It had PVC windows. It had grass outside the front door. It was on the ground floor. It wasn't a tower block. Only been built about four or five years. I remember picking the keys up when I went through the front door for the very first time. I walked into the living room. It was a one-bedroom flat. The living room was at the back, and I looked out the window, and there was these rolling hills. I'm thinking, this is that country lifestyle that I've seen on the telly, Emmerdale Farm. <laughs> so I took it. I got my grants from the council, put my nylon carpets down, put my net curtains up, got my grants from my cooker in my fridge, went to our parade dog zone, got myself a little Jack Russell called her Kim. She had a black patch on one eye, short, stumpy tail, and she was really aggressive. <laughs> Thursdays were the best days of the week for me because I used to cash for benefits on a Thursday. Some of you may remember the books you used to have and you tear a page out and they give you your money now, it's all digital, but in those days it was a book. This particular Thursday, I go into my post office, I get my money, and I get on this bus to go into Rochdale Town Centre, because that's where the hostel was. And I, well, it was just on the outskirts where I was living now, so I was going back into the town centre where, where the hostel was and where the shops were. The bus takes off, it stops at the next stop, and this guy gets on. He had a boss got tattooed on his face, which is like a tattoo beauty spot that they did to say that they'd been in bars. Well, some lads still do it, and women. He had a big fat neck and short stumpy fingers. Have you ever been on a bus or a train or a tram and it's full, there's two seats spare, one on one side and one next to you? And somebody gets on, you think, oh no, he hope he sits on that seat and you're kind of moving over to. <laughs> well, he didn't sit on that seat, he sat on this seat. 
Are you all right, mate? How are you doing? I'm thinking if it's doing all right to so you, sat down. <laughs> My name's John. And we got chatting, and it was really genuine. Talked about music and stuff that I'm still interested in music, and he was, and there was a connection. I remember getting to the bus that day thinking, that guy was all right. He had something that was different, apart from a fat neck, that is. There was something about him. That was the Thursday. The following Sunday, I was taking my dog Kim for a walk. And I was taking her to these fields behind the local hospital. So as I was walking past the hospital, I bumped into this guy. Are you all right, mate? How you doing? Remember me? Of course I remember you. Chit chat, chit chat. Where have you been? I've been to church. Oh no. It's a Bible basher. You can come if you want. We meet every Sunday in the hospital grounds. Mate, it's all right. Church ain't my thing. Okay, he went his way, I went mine. The next day, I'm taking my dog for a walk again, like I did every day, taking it to the same fields. But now, as I'm walking past the hospital, I'm looking for a church. But I was looking for a building with a steeple tower, stained glass windows, graveyard, Somebody stood at the door rest like Darth Vader. <laughs> I can't see a church in there. Come here, Kim. He must have been having me on. Next day, taking me dog for a walk, looking for a church. No way could I see a church. There's no church in there. Wednesday was my first appointment in this new area with my new psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Samuel Yangi. He was from Nigeria. Thought nothing of that appointment that afternoon, taking me dog for a walk, looking for a church. No way could I see a church. Must have been having me on. Friday morning, there's a knock on my front door. Who's that? Is that the coppers? Natural reaction still today. <laughs> then I thought, no, they don't knock. <laughs> and I walked into the hallway, and I was looking for the shape of the copper through the frosted glass and the net curtain. Some of you will remember that back in the day, have you got any ex-police in here? No, police. Well, back in the day, the police needed to be a certain height to get in. Nowadays, they're not fussed to let anybody in. And I'm looking through this, the frosted glass, I'm thinking, that can't be a copper, that. It's too small. I open the door, it's this little woman, four foot eight, 21 stone. <laughs> there are plastic glasses with sellotape at the side. Are you all right, cock? My name's Dot, I'm your next door but one neighbour. I'm like, yeah, all right, Dot, yeah, yeah. I've come to introduce myself. You've just moved in, haven't you? Well, yeah, about five weeks ago. You've come up from Manchester, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Your dad drives a red car, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. You've not got much furniture, have you? No, I haven't. I'm thinking, how does you know all this lot? <laughs> nosy neighbours. Are you a nosy neighbour? We were chatting. And just before she left, I don't know if you can help me, Doc. But the other day, I was taking my dog for a walk past the hospital up the road, and I met this guy, and he told me that he went to church in the hospital grounds, and this week I've been looking for that church, and I can't see it. Do you know where it is? Of course I do. I go to that church. <laughs> I'll take it on Sunday. I'm, oh, no, I didn't want that. <laughs> Remember walking in. Building this size, it wasn't a church building, it was like a prefab, a community centre it was. People dressed really casual, a bit scruffy really, a bit like you lot. <laughs> I walked in, she sits on the second row from the front on the NC. I sit next to her, I looked at my watch thinking, what time is this going to be over? Then there was a tap on my shoulder, I looked round, it was the guy that met on the bus. The guy with the balls up, the big fat neck and the short stumpy fingers. Are you all right, mate? I didn't think you were interested in coming. I wasn't, but Dot knocked. He said, you don't need to introduce me to Dot. Well done, Dot, for bringing him. I'm thinking, these two have set me up. <laughs> he sits on the other side. His wife and his kids fill the rest of the row up. And now sat between the two thinking, beam me up, Scotty. And then he heard the words behind me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I didn't know what that meant then. I looked round. It was my Nigerian psychiatrist. <laughs> Remember, I wasn't well. <laughs> I'm thinking, have these guys been following me? How did he plan to be at that bus stop? 
How did she get her, how did she get her flat before I got mine? How did he get his job here before? I'm trying to work it all out. My doctor sat on the road directly behind me. Talk about under pressure. Does he recognise me? It's a rocking that daft. Hmm. My first day in church was a culture clash. The music started, and one of the guys decided he was going to have a dance. And he started to do this skipping thing at the Pentecostal two-step up and down the front of the church. I think he was so, what about? The guy that I met on the bus was a proper man's man. Cauliflower ears, broken nose, skinhead, tattoos. Really good looking guy. <laughs> and I clocked him out the corner of my eye and he was like, we are marching in the lineup. I'm thinking men don't do that. <laughs> so he's doing this thing and this other guy's doing this skipping thing and then my next little neighbour reached underneath the chair. She put her hand in an Aldi bag. She pulled out a tambourine. <laughs> ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. I'm thinking, man, if people had told me church is this good, I'd have been here years ago. This is better than any drug I've ever taken. So this guy's doing this skipping thing, and he's doing this kitchen, and she's getting eat kitchen. Then I looked over my shoulder, my Nigerian psychiatrist, Samuel is a mate now. He had a Bible underneath his arm, big enough to choke a giraffe. She came on a Honda. She came on a Honda. Who came on a Honda? <laughs> she tied my bow tie too tight. You know, everywhere wearing this bow tie. I crack a my shin on a calagacita. I'm thinking there's no calagacita, and he was using this language. I'm thinking that's not Nigerian, even I know that. And then I looked at him and thought, man, that's my psychiatrist. <laughs> He's treating me. <laughs> Never going to get better. Ooh, my first day in church was a culture class. If you're a visitor tonight and you're feeling about a place, this is nothing. Then the guy gets up to speak, and after this spiel, he said, we believe in a God who can heal. Is there anybody in this room with any issues? <laughs> Is he having a laugh? Got more issues than Vogue. If you want to be prayed for, for anything, come to the front. I thought, what have I got to lose? So I walked up from a loads of attitude. Do you know, I wasn't brought up in a religious family. Sport was, religion in our, was the religion in our house. Three lads and old sisters. But for me, music had become... Something I got something out of. But every now and again, every now and again, I'd think, oh, there must be a God, and that's it. But this guy's telling me, is God can help me with my issues? I thought, what have I got to lose? So I walked to the front. What can I pray for? I'm thinking, how long have you got? <laughs> what time do you want to be out of here? So I told him I'm on 55 mils of methadone, which is like a heroin substitute. I've been an addict now for 15 years, but the main thing I need prayer for is that I hear voices. In fact, my daughter's just sat down there. Okay, I'll pray with you. So I thought, I'll close my eyes because that's what you do in church. And he put his hand on me and I'm thinking, what's he touching me for? I was going to but I thought, I better not. I'll roll with it because I'm in his gaff. And he started to pray. And as he started to pray, I remember shaking as he was praying. I had tears running down. But listen, I'm a man's man. But I come from... Crime is a sign of weakness, but on that day, tears were streaming down my cheek, cheeks. I had a feeling inside my stomach like this. See, I'm thinking, wow, wow, what's this? Uh, what's getting your hand off my head? Wow. And then he said, amen. I'm like, what does that mean? And he opened my eyes, and he sat down, and thinking, I could have told me you're done. <laughs> and I walked back to my seat, and from that point on, something changed. You see, all my natural get up and go had got up and gone. Drugs had become my get up and go. I needed them to function. But on that day, all my natural get up and go that had got up and gone, got up and came back because God became my get up and go. Something happened. That's when there was a massive turning point in my life. I realized that my mess could become a message. And that most of all, God valued me more than anything. You know, you know God's not fussy, is he? It's a good job. Look at some of your faces. <laughs> Within four weeks of me being prayed for, I stopped taking drugs. And I haven't taken drugs since. And I could give you Samuel's phone number, who I mentioned is now my friend. 
not my psychiatrist. He's now in Lincoln. He would verify all of this. Something changed. I was buzzing that day. Remember walking home? My neck. And I walked into my little flat, closed the door behind me and stood in the hallway. No voices for the first time in nine years. I haven't heard voices since, until I got married to my wife. <laughs> Worse than they've ever been. <laughs> then I went off to a college, Cliff Bible College, not too far away from here, actually. And I realized that I had a brain. I was given a second chance to get into education, and I grafted, and I did really well. And then I got busy setting up a charity because I, I had ideas about the future, what I wanted to do, so I wanted to create what I wanted to be part of, so I set up Proclaim Trust. As you've already heard, I'm still the CEO of Proclaim Trust. We had £10 in the bank then. We've still got £10 in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I've travelled to India speaking. I've travelled to Sri Lanka several times. I've travelled to America. I've been to Argentina more than time, many times to Argentina. I've been to Italy, I've been to Germany. But I made a conscious decision 12 years ago to go nowhere other than the UK. So now I use this phrase on socials, the UK is my parish. So I'll go anywhere in the UK, but I won't go anywhere outside of the UK. On holiday, of course. <laughs> I'll go on holiday abroad. But as far as my, 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 my boundary lines are within the UK. As I mentioned before, I'm travelling down to to Ipswich tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking in a prison on Tuesday night, and then I come back, do something local for the weekend, then I'm off to Scotland for a week, doing a few jails and a few churches up that neck of the woods. And people say to me, Barry, why do you do what you do? Well, there's one reason. <laughs> the reason why I do what I do is because I want people to get what I've got. Look, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, God... God who flung the stars into space, God who spoke the universe into being, God put skin on and he became a man. His name is Jesus. And he came to this earth and he was tempted just like us, but he resisted temptation. And at the age of 33, he allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. He did that to pay the price for your faults, your flaws and for your failures. He did that so that you could have a second chance, a third chance and a fourth chance to put things right for you. So it doesn't matter where you're at, you can set out down a different track. If he was a burglar, do you know what God would do? He'd try and break into your life. He'd wait for it to go dark and he'd come and he'd try and kick in the back door. If he couldn't kick in the back door, he'd try and kick in the side door. If he couldn't kick in the side door, he'd try and jam in through the windows. That's if God was a burglar. But he's not. You see, God will only ever come in through the legal entry. The legal entry to my house at home is the front door. The front door to a life is your will. And he stands at that door and he knocks. And he knocks and he waits for you to open the door. He waits for you to give him consent to come in. And when you give him consent to come in, he starts to work alongside you. He gives you the strength for your struggles. And he empowers you to change the things that you can't change yourself. See, he does everything with us. So I'm going to land this now before we have a few nibbles by praying a prayer. I'm going to invite two groups of people in this room to pray this prayer. And if you're watching online, you can pray this prayer too. There's two groups of people. The first group are those people in this room you've never prayed a prayer, you've never given God consent to come in. He's standing at your door. He's waiting for you to open it so he can get involved, so he can step in. The first group could be that you've been attending this church for a while. It could be that you've been coming to church to please your spouse. That's great. But what about you? It could be that you're a visitor and you didn't know what to expect. He stood outside your door. It could be that you've been watching online for a while, but you've not been into this church building. It could be that you've just dropped on there right now and you didn't know what to expect. Look, he stood outside your door. And the second group of people are those people you may have prayed a prayer in the past and you've got going on your Christian journey, but you, don't, you know for whatever reason right now on your pathway you're not really cutting it. 
You're not living how he wants you to live. Pray this prayer to get back on track. So they're the two groups. And if you're in the room, you make up the third group because you're going to pray to encourage the first group and the second group. Are we ready? All three groups. Repeat after me, whether you're watching online or whether you're in the room. Dear God, I come to you today and I admit that I'm not perfect. God, I ask that you forgive me for my faults, for my flaws, and for my failures. God, I ask that you wipe my slate clean because right now I'm opening my door and I'm inviting you in. And God, I ask that you give me the strength that I need for the struggles that I'm in. If you're in the room and you've prayed that prayer and you're part of the first group or the second group, can you put up your hand so I can see it? Anybody part of the first group or the second group? You put up your hand so I can see it. I'm going to count down five seconds. There's people in this room who's prayed that. If you're watching online, keep watching. There's people in this room who's prayed that prayer. You're part of the first group or the second group. I'm going to say to you, park your pride outside. Don't let your pride get in the way as I count down five seconds. Anybody in this room pray that prayer. You're part of the first group or the second group as I count down five. Anybody? Four. Anybody in this room? Three. The first group are those people who have never prayed a prayer to give God consent to come into their lives. The second group are those people who have done that in the past, but for whatever reason, you're not living how God wants you to live, so you're praying it to get back on track. The third is everybody else. The Christians who are praying it to encourage the first group and the second group. So anybody else, as I count, anybody, as I count, I've got one at the back, thank you. Now we've explained it. Anybody else, as I count down, four, three, two, one. If you're watching online and you've prayed that prayer, I don't know how you're watching, whether it's through YouTube or, or, or Facebook, put something in the comment box, I prayed, or in the chat, I prayed, so we know that you've prayed that prayer. Okay, remember, I've not come here tonight to glorify my past. The reason I've come here tonight is to tell you my story so that you can look at me and think, hey, if anybody can change, if he can change, anybody can change. In fact, if he can change and stay changed, that means anybody can change and stay changed. My name is Barry Woodward. I was once an addict, and now I'm clean. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. That was great. It was good, it was good wasn't it? Um, what a powerful, powerful story. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, please feel free. To, we've still got a bit of time on our hands. Uh, we're going to have a, some refreshments and some more drinks. And there's a little quiz uh, for us to be having a go at as well. Um, but, you know, during this time, uh, if you've got any questions or, or queries you want to ask, uh, feel free uh, to chat, chat with Barry uh, here. And I'm sure he'll love to have a talk, talk with you. Um, you know, we, we're all on a journey. Uh, we're all, you know, and we're all at different places, different stages. And uh, the wonderful truth is that God meets us exactly where, where we're at. And he's inviting us to come to him. You know, I, I don't have Barry's story. Very different. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, wh wherever you're at, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And don't let this uh, evening pass by without talking to someone uh, if you have more questions to ask. And so, uh, guys, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to have some refreshments. So we've, we've, we've flipped it around uh, tonight. Uh, so there'll be more tea, some more teas and coffees. And there's a little quiz Okay, for you to have a go at doing. Okay, the, the question is, I think we've got something on the screen in a minute, just a little intro, but the question is this. Uh, what are the 10 most iconic and beloved TV or movie animals of all time? Now, now I know we all have different opinions. Okay, all right then. <laughs> oh, we all have different opinions on this, I know, okay? But I am going according to ChatGPT, okay? 
So if that says that, it must be right. Okay, that's like a, a Google thing. Okay, but anyway, have a go, discuss it amongst yourselves, and then at the end we'll uh, have a little go through the answers. But bless you guys. that do